If you have a copy of God's Word, please take it and turn with me to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Again, happy Mother's Day. We are glad that you and your family are with us today. Speaking of families, we are very um, excited. I'm sure most of you watched the news this past week that it is possible uh, via the news reporting that the Supreme Court could overturn Roe versus Wade. And we are very thankful for that. We are thankful for that, not out of political motivation, but one of theological and biblical that we believe every human being bears the image of God. And as such, every human being, whether convenient or not, has inherent dignity and worth. And so we are pro-life not out of political motivation, but theological and biblical. But I also want to say this. We as a church have and are currently and will continue to minister to moms who find themselves with unplanned pregnancies. We've partnered with our local women's clinic, or Metroplex Women's Clinic. We've actually purchased a sonogram as a part of launch, and we also are engaged in a ministry called Embrace Grace, where we come alongside moms in challenging situations and minister to them. And so I'm very thankful, church family, to be a part of a church that is Uh, full of courage and conviction, but also full of compassion and care and love for the least of these in our culture. John 21, we're going to be finishing our study through the gospel of John this week and next as we wrap up John. We've been in this book for almost a year and a half now, and I'm excited to bring this home. So if you've got John 21 open, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. John 21, please stand. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14 today. The Bible says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing. Somebody in the first service said, Amen. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you will find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And Simon Peter heard it was the Lord. He tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bringing some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said, told them. So Simon Peter climbed up, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this incredible gift and privilege you've given us to come together around your word and to hear from you. God, I pray that your spirit would bring this word to life, that you would speak to us, God. Lord Jesus, as you speak by your Spirit, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the Word, but that we would be doers as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you have ever tried to put something together without reading the instructions? Raise your hand. Some of you are willing to admit it. We've all been there, right? Christmas or birthday, you open a gift. You look at the picture, it looks easy enough, looks like it's no problem, but an hour later you're on the floor and it's just not coming together. How many of you have regretted not looking at the instructions before you put something together? All of us have. 
In John 21, Jesus is giving instructions about how the disciples are to live out the mission of Jesus. This is, in a sense, an instruction manual as to how they're to live out the mission he's given them. This is important because the context is built to this moment. Jesus has told them that as the Father sent him, so he's sending his disciples. He's giving his disciples a mission. The mission of Jesus for followers of Jesus is to experience and proclaim Jesus' priesthood and his kingship. We've seen these two ideas running all throughout the Gospel of John, that Jesus is priest and that he's king. As our high priest, he died in our place, taking the wrath and the justice of God that we deserved. And as our king, he rose from the dead to give us new life. We live out the mission of Jesus when we not only experience that, we experience his grace and his transformation, when we proclaim that mission of grace and mercy as Jesus is priest and king. This passage, though, is going to specifically show us how we do that. How do we live out this mission of Jesus that he's given us as priest and king? This is really important because I'm convinced a lot of Christians understand the what of the Christian life, but how to live it is unclear. A lot of people understand basic affirmations. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. He's coming back. They understand those ideas. But when you talk about what it means to live out the mission of Christ in their workplace as a parent, as an employer, as a student, as a mom, as a dad, as a child, it gets fuzzy. And so what we want to look at this morning is very clearly seeing that God cares not just about the what of your life, but he cares about how you live out the mission of Jesus in your life. There are two scenes of this story that help us see this. I want you to write this first one down if you're taking notes. First thing we see in this passage is the need for Christ's power. First way that you and I begin to understand how we're to live out the mission of Christ is we have to understand our need for Christ's power. Verse 1 talks about this idea of revelation to kind of set this up. Look in your Bibles at verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Now, I see just in one verse, John has used the word revealed twice because it's revelation that's going to be in the focus here. Jesus has already revealed himself twice to his disciples as he appeared in their midst as they were in that upper room with the door locked. Here, Jesus comes to them in a different place. He's revealing himself again to them because they are in need of further revelation. They need more help to understand how they're going to live out this mission he's given them. There's also some significance to the geography here. Did you notice that he said that it's at the Sea of Tiberias? The Sea of Tiberias is where Jesus walked on water. It's where he fed the 5,000. It's where he explained that if you're going to take part in him, you had to eat his body and drink his blood. You had to trust him completely, Jesus says in John 6. And so all of this would have been in the background in the disciples' minds as they made their way to the Sea of Tiberias. That's exactly what happened as Simon Peter and six other disciples, seven total, decided they were going to go fishing. Now, it's not clear why Peter and his friends go fishing. Some people think they were being disobedient. Some people think they were discouraged or despondent. I happen to believe they were going back to what was familiar to them. They were fishermen. This was their job. This was what they did. And so, though Jesus has given them some incredible mission, they're still trying to process what does it mean to be sent by Jesus as the Father sent the Son. So, they go fishing. In verse 3, look at your Bible, tells us what happened. It says, they went out, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now, these are experienced fishermen. They know the sea, they know the lay of the land, and they catch nothing while they're there. John also points out that it's night, and you'll remember John's consistent use of symbolism in his gospel. Oftentimes, night or darkness speaks to a misunderstanding or a, a blindness in the people, and it represents that while the disciples are there and they're trying their best to figure things out, they don't understand what Jesus has really called them to do. They're fishing. This is representative from other Gospels of Jesus' mission. He told them he was going to make them fishers of men. 
John is showing that while they're trying to live out the mission of Christ, they're trying to do what he's called them to do, they're unsuccessful. This is really important because what John wants us to see is that Christ's mission cannot be accomplished in human strength alone. He's wanting us to see that the mission Jesus gives his disciples cannot happen in their strength and power. This is important because this is consistent with the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel starts with bad news. The bad news is we need help. We don't have what it takes. We're unable to save ourselves. Listen to what Romans 3 says in verse 9 and 11, 9 through 11. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. The good news of the gospel starts with bad news. You and I are sinners that have rejected God's authority and as such deserve his wrath and his justice in an everlasting hell. We are unable to save ourselves just as the disciples were unable to carry out this mission. But the passage moves forward to Jesus showing up. And as Jesus shows up, something incredible happens. Look at verse 4. It says, When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? Now, that first word in verse 5 is one you can read over very quickly and miss, but it's significant. Jesus calls these disciples friends. He calls them friends because at this point in Jesus' mission, he's died as their priest, taking the wrath and the justice of God on the cross, and he's risen again to new life as their king to give them the new life that only he can give And so because these disciples have trusted Christ, he calls them friends. He calls them his brothers. He calls them his family. This is consistent teaching throughout the New Testament that when you come to know Christ, you are adopted as sons and daughters of the king. And so while the gospel starts with bad news, it doesn't stay at bad news. It moves to glorious news that in Christ, you can be made right with God. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you don't know Jesus. What he offers you is peace with God and adoption. If you turn from your sin and you trust him, you can be called his friend, his son, his daughter, as a forgiving child of the king. If you aren't a Christian, we would love the opportunity to pray with you, talk with you. After the service is over, out these doors to my right is our next step corner. We would love a chance to pray with you and talk with you and answer any questions you might have about what it means to be a Christian. As the light breaks through, though, their eyes are beginning to be opened. And though they don't know who Jesus is, they begin to interact with him. They're about a football field offshore, about 100 yards. Jesus is calling out to them. He asks them if they have any fish. They say no. Then Jesus does something very interesting in verse 6. He gives them a command. I want you to look at with me there in your Bibles. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Though they didn't know Jesus, they heard his voice and obeyed. And they caught so many fish, they could not haul the nets into the boat. What is John showing us? John is showing us that the only way to live out the mission of Christ is going to be in the power of Christ. See, the problem with these disciples was not their strategy for fishing. It wasn't their net. It wasn't that they were in the wrong spot of the lake there. It's that they didn't have Jesus. Write this down if you're taking notes. We live Christ's mission in Christ's power. We live the mission of Christ, experiencing and proclaiming Jesus as priest and king, We live that mission out, not apart from Christ, not separated from him, but in his power. Now, this is important because it creates a tension in our lives as disciples, as followers of Jesus. The tension is, it's our mission, but Christ's power. We have been given this mission. We have a weighty and glorious responsibility 
to proclaim Jesus as king to the world. But yet, we must do it in Christ's power. What this passage calls us to confront is the impossibility of the mission Jesus has given us on our own. Think about impossible jobs today in our culture. Thinking about this this past week about NFL coaches. Anybody know the average tenure of an NFL coach right now? I looked it up on the internet so I know it's true. Uh, three, three, <laughs> 3.2 years is the average tenure of an NFL coach right now. Saw that the Jacksonville Jaguars hired a new coach in February. You know how many games the Jaguars have won in the last two years? Four games total. Looks like an impossible job. I watch those guys coach and the personalities they have to deal with and the owners and the pressure. It looks like an impossible job. But as I was thinking about impossible jobs this past week, I also thought about our teachers. I think uh, our teachers, especially this year, have been given impossible jobs. And I know we have some teachers in our church family. I want you to know that, uh, teachers, I regularly pray for you. I am so thankful for you. Because I think coming out of COVID and some of the behavioral challenges you're facing, the disintegration of the family and the respect for authority in our culture, coupled with the fact that our culture basically expects education system to fix everything, creates this perfect storm of intense pressure our teachers are under. So I just want you to know, teachers, I am thankful for you and what you're doing because I look at your job and I think it's impossible. I look at my kids' teachers and I'm just begging them not to quit this year, right? It's really hard. But as hard as teaching and being an NFL coach might be, we might could be able to conceive of a change in the circumstances that would make it more manageable. Maybe fewer expectations on teachers and administrators or our parents being more supportive. We, we could come up with some like situation where we could kind of conceive of it being manageable. But what John 21 makes clear is that there is no way to make the mission of Jesus manageable. There's no set of circumstances. There's no preferred future. There's no inner strength you and I have that makes the mission Christ has given us possible on our own. So here's the application. You and I have got to regularly repent of self-sufficiency. You and I, if we're going to live out what I think these first six verses show us, have got to repent and confront Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is this idea that you on your own, I on my own, have what it takes. This is everywhere in our culture. It's so ingrained in the cultural conversation, it's just, it's not even recognized anymore. It shows up in this extreme elevation of the idea of autonomy, that you get to define things for yourself, that you get to define your gender, your sexuality, your sense of personhood, your identity for yourself. I've told you guys before that I think this incredible emphasis on autonomy and self-sufficiency is causing skyrocketing, skyrocketing feelings of anxiety in our people. When you have to figure all that out for yourself, all these massive questions that previous generations thought God answered, what does that do to you? It makes you anxious. Some of us are feeling a lot of anxiety in our lives because we've bought the lie of autonomy. Part of what we must regularly do is confront the fact that we are creatures. We are humans with limits, with weakness, with frailty, with brokenness. Let me tell you something. Peace is not found in ignoring your limits. Peace is found in leaning into your limits, acknowledging that you are a human that's desperately in need of God. One of the great challenges you and I face today is that because of the advances in technology and medicine, we forget how much we actually need God. If you were to take this group and, and take us in a DeLorean back 150 years, every single family that was raising a family 150 years ago would have been confronted with infant mortality and with a much shorter life expectancy. In other words, death would have been much more like in our face as a culture. And while I'm thankful for advances in medicine and technology, the liability to advances in those areas is that you and I are not as regularly confronted with our humanity via death. That's why, people, that's why modern people don't like to talk about death, don't like to think about death, don't want don't to confront it in any way because it confronts us with the lie that autonomy is pushing every single moment of every single day. 
These first six verses say, if we're going to live out the mission of Christ, if we're going to experience and proclaim his priesthood and his kingship, it starts by regularly repenting of self-sufficiency. Here's what that practically looks like in your life. You can regularly undercut self-sufficiency and autonomy through the ministry of prayer. Show me your prayer life, and I'll show you the degree to which self-sufficiency is ruling and reigning in your life. You know why? Prayer is your basic way of saying, I don't have this. I don't got it. Prayer, at the most basic level, is saying, help. I need help. And so while I think it's appropriate to say amen at the end of our prayers, can I just encourage you to think, think of your prayer life less as a isolated kind of moments, rather just one continuous conversation you're having with God throughout the day. Live your life praying regularly as you undercut self-sufficiency and autonomy. But the second thing this passage reveals is not just the need for Christ's power. It also reveals the application of Christ's power. Okay? Jesus gives them this incredible haul with the fish. Sorry about that. Incredible haul of fish. The disciples are amazed. But John wants to go deeper. He doesn't just want to show us that we need Christ's power. He wants to show how we're called to live in Christ's power. Now, the way this second scene of the story breaks out, there's two kind of sub-scenes, okay? 7 through 11, there's one idea we're going to talk about. And verses 12 through 14, there's another idea we're going to talk about. These two ideas are going to unpack how you live the mission of Christ in the power of Christ. And what John's doing as he walks us through these two sub-scenes is he's talking about the role Jesus has in your life, and the role you have in your life. Look at these with me. Verse 7 through 11 starts, write this down if you're taking notes, with Christ's provision. That's not going to be on the screen. That's just something I want you to write down if you're taking notes. Christ's provision. First thing we see is Jesus providing for the disciples. After Jesus provides this incredible haul of fish, John, the disciple Jesus loves, and notice it's Jesus he tells Peter, and what does Peter do? Peter's going to Peter, right? He jumps in the water, and he swims towards Jesus. He swims towards the shore. We're going to come back to Peter next week as we round out Gospel of John. But as they make their way to the shore, Jesus begins to interact with him, and we see a significant part of what John wants us to notice about Christ's power. Look at verse 9 with me. It says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus provides breakfast for the disciples and 153 fish. Now, I don't, I'm not persuaded by the symbolic kind of arguments that are made about 153. I just think to me it's a lot of fish, okay? It's a lot of fish. It's a huge amount that Christ has provided. And part of what John is contrasting is he's contrasting the disciples' inadequacy with Christ's power. Here the disciples have spent all night trying to catch just one fish and have been unsuccessful. Jesus, in just a moment, provides not just breakfast for them, but 153 other fish. What John is showing us is the provision of Christ, the power of Christ in this harvest. You know, one of the ways you can see the greatness of somebody is when they can take something very difficult and make it look easy. I remember growing up in the 90s and watching the NBA All-Star Game. And I remember watching the slam dunk contest, okay? And I would watch these people spin around and do all these really cool dunks. And then I would go in the backyard and try to do it myself. It didn't go very well, okay? Like, I just couldn't jump as high as they could. I couldn't spin around like they could. And I would try, and I probably looked really ridiculous. I'm really glad nobody had a phone back then, okay? No phones and cameras when I was growing up like that. Why? Well, what I found out was going on was, while it looked really easy on television, it's actually really hard in real life. Sign of greatness is somebody who can take something that's very difficult and make it look easy. Jesus has taken something that was incredibly difficult for the disciples and made it look like it was nothing. 
What is this telling us? John wants us to see that Jesus provides the results the disciples are called to obey. Jesus provides the harvest disciples are called to sow and reap. Jesus is the one who gives the fruit. We are called to be faithful. How do you live out the power of Christ on a daily basis? It's by faithfully serving Jesus and trusting him with the results. But the second idea here is not just the faithfulness of the disciples as they trust the provision of Christ. The second thing I want you to write down is Christ's presence. First thing was Christ's provision. That's 7 through 11. 12 through 14 is Christ's presence. Look what happens in verse 12 through 14 as Jesus continues to interact with the disciples. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. John tells us that the disciples know it's Jesus. They have a clear sense that it's him. They've become convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. He's the resurrected, ruling, reigning Savior. They've trusted him. But what Jesus does is he invites them to be with him, to spend time with him, to have breakfast with him. There's debate about 13, whether there's a symbolic idea of the Lord's Supper, where Jesus is giving the bread and he's giving the fish. However you understand that what Jesus is doing is inviting them to commune and to fellowship with him. I love the way one commentator put it where he said, the ministry of Jesus starts with a meal and it ends with a meal. Starts with the wedding, Cain of Galilee, where he turns water into wine, right? And it ends here. But here's the shift in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John starts with come and see, come and watch, come and behold the Son of God. It ends with come and be with me. It ends with come and fellowship with me, come and have communion with me. The point is that we must carry out the mission of Jesus in his power, living in his presence. You and I are called not just to faithfully serve Christ as he provides for us, we're to faithfully commune with Christ in his presence. Now, here's the question. How in the world can we faithfully serve Jesus in his power and regularly experience his presence if he's going back to the Father? How in the world Are we going to be able to do this with Jesus going back to the right hand of the Father to intercede for us? What John 21, I believe, points to is to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is how you and I experience the faithfulness of Jesus as we see his power working through us. And how we experience the presence of Christ as we fellowship with him. This is why Jesus said in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Jesus said it's better that he goes back to the Father. Why? Listen to what he says in verse, chapter 16, verse 7. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. I believe what John 21 is doing is putting a huge flashing sign to the ministry and the power of the Spirit in our lives. How do you live out the mission of Christ and the power of Christ? It's through the Holy Spirit. Let me say it this way, and just, this is the way just kind of bring this to a head and sum up where we're going as we finish this message. Live Christ's mission through fellowship and faithfulness. What I believe the second scene of this story tells us is that the way you and I live out the mission of Christ and the power of Christ is by fellowshipping with Jesus and being faithful to Jesus. As we close, I want to just spend some time thinking about fellowship and faithfulness. Faithfulness and fellowship. On the one hand, think with me for a moment about fellowship with Christ and the Spirit. You and I have been given the incredible privilege every day via the Spirit of experiencing the presence of Jesus to commune with Jesus, to be with Jesus, to enjoy Jesus. Do you think of your time with the Lord as enjoying Jesus? 
when I was dating Shelly, um, when I got to the place where I knew I wanted to marry her was when I knew I enjoyed being around her. I just enjoyed her. Yes, she was beautiful. Yes, I was impressed by her. Yes, I thought she was wonderful. But when I just saw over and over again that when I left her presence, I was charged, I was encouraged, I was refreshed. When I realized that I could just be myself around her, that I didn't have to put on any airs, I just enjoyed being with her and she enjoyed being with me. There was this vibrancy. I was like, I want that for the rest of my life. Where do I sign up for that? So I asked her to marry me. She said yes. Did you know that you have a similar kind of connection with Jesus via the Spirit? Did you know if you're a child of the King, Jesus enjoys you? He enjoys his children. Did you know that you have the privilege via the Spirit to enjoy him, to experience his presence, to experience the fact that he's pleased with you, that he loves you? What I want for you more than anything, church, It's for every day for you to experience real intimacy with Christ. (laughs) That he loves you. That he cares about you. That via the Spirit, because if the Spirit lives within you, you can fellowship with him. You can enjoy his presence. The primary way you and I enjoy the presence of Christ is through the Bible. The reason we encourage you to read your Bible every day is not because we're trying to guilt you. Not because we're trying to get you to check a box. It's because we genuinely believe this is how you fellowship and commune with God. Every single time you open this book, God is speaking to you, Christian. Now, we might be distracted. We have some barriers to listening that are going on in our own lives. But it does not change the fact that when you open this word, God is speaking to you. This is why we talk about Bible reading at First Baptist in terms of fellowship with God. Primarily, the Bible is not an instruction manual. Primarily, the Bible is not a guide for how to live your life. Primarily, the Bible is revelation of God to you. Now, does it give you guidance? Yes. Does it give you instruction on how to live? Of course. But first and foremost, remember what you're doing when you read the Bible is you're spending time with God. So what I want for you every single day, if we're going to live out the mission of Christ and the power of Christ, is for you to fellowship with Jesus and the Spirit and the Word. But the second idea I mentioned was not just fellowship with Christ, but faithfulness to Jesus, faithfulness to Christ. It's really important to understand that our job is faithfulness. Christ's job is fruitfulness. Your job is to be faithful and trust the results to God. Here's a really nasty side effect of self-sufficiency and autonomy in our culture. The nasty side effect of self-sufficiency in our cultural moment is the illusion of control. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but are there any control freaks out there? So I will raise my hand and just admit I, I am one of these. I like making lists. I like getting stuff done. I consider myself a somewhat productive person. But you know what I've discovered? I'm in a season of life where I'm not all that productive. Um told you guys that over a month ago, my, my dad passed away. And as I've been grieving my father's passing, what I've realized is I'm just not as productive as I once was. And so as I've gone to grief counseling, and I've been in grief counseling now for about a month, one of the things that I've been working through with my counselor is recognizing that while lists and productivity is fine, while working hard is not a problem, if it's covering up a control issue that I have, it's a problem. And so you know what I've had to do in this season of my life? As I've just had to accept, I am not going to be as productive as I normally am. And that's okay. You know why? Because I stink at being God. And so do you. I'm not in control. And sometimes it takes an acute occurrence like a death or something very tragic happening to us to open our eyes for us to really see how much, how little control we actually have. But it's important for you and I to recognize that my job Your job as a Christian is faithfully obeying Jesus and the season of life we're in and leaving the results to him. Let me tell you something. If you understand that your job is faithfulness and Christ's job is fruitfulness, it will change your life. You can't control every outcome of every situation of every person in your life. It's impossible. 
This passage calls us to remember it's not our job to control every outcome. It's not our job to control every circumstance. It's our job to be obedient, faithful disciples, trusting sovereignly to God what only he can do. Christ's mission and Christ's power means that in your work, your role is an advancement, trying to politic your way to a promotion. Your role in your workplace is to please your heavenly father. I've got a friend right now who's on the edge of some pretty significant career advancement. It's been so encouraging to watch him be faithful, not try to politic to get an advancement or promotion or be friends with the right person, but just to be faithful and to watch God open doors. Your job in your workplace is to be faithful to your heavenly father as a calling from him and trust him with the results. Your job as a parent isn't to control your kids. It's to be an ambassador of Christ on behalf of your Savior. Now, when I say this, kids typically are like shouting up and down and, and you know, yelling amen and all that kind of stuff. And what, I mean, what I don't mean is that we're not called to have authority in the lives of our children. It doesn't mean we're not called to discipline or guide them. It just means that my kids are not my own. My kids don't belong to me. They belong to God. He's entrusted them to me for a season. And in this season, I'm to be an ambassador. I point them to Jesus. I talk to them about Christ. I pray with them. I read scripture with them. And then I trust God to do what only he can do in their lives. How about in your marriage? Your role isn't to fix your spouse. It's to serve them. Doesn't mean we can't point out faults and failures as brothers and sisters in Christ in marriage. But first and foremost, I'm called to serve my spouse. How about in evangelism? My goal is not winning arguments or proving how smart I am. My goal is to truthfully, lovingly, clearly present the gospel and leave the results to God. How about in our country? Our job is not to defeat our political opponents, but to pray and beg God to move in their hearts. How about in our church? Living out the mission and power of Christ in our church means that church is not about what I can get out of it, but rather about how God can use me in this place for my good, for the good of these people, and for God's glory. You and I are called to live out the mission of Christ and the power of Christ in fellowship with him and faithfully serving him. Live at peace, Christian, with the reality that your job is faithfulness, God's job is sovereignly running the universe. Leave that to him and lay your head on your pillow every night at peace, knowing that he's in control. Part of the peace we have in Jesus is knowing that the mission of Christ will ultimately be fulfilled in the return of Christ, where we read these words in Revelation 21. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people and God will himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you. This passage has made crystal clear to us how we're to live out your mission in your power. We're to do so in fellowship with you, Jesus, but also in faithfulness to you. I pray for this church family. I pray that we as a body of believers, God, would be faithful to fellowship with you with every day, to prioritize spending time with you in the word, but also to live in the freedom of faithfully serving you. That God, your job is running the universe. Our job as as human beings being faithful seat and you've put us in where you've placed us. God, I pray for people here today that are struggling with anxiety. They're struggling with being overwhelmed and just burdened with the cares and concerns of this life. I pray that you would minister to their souls right now with the truth that they don't have what it takes and that's okay because you do, Lord. You care about them. You love them. You're calling them to live in your power and grace and I pray that you would comfort them right now presence and your peace. I pray for the parents in the room, God, who may be parenting out of fear right now, parenting to control, parenting to 
try to manipulate. God, I pray that we would take our hands off of that kind of style of parenting and would trust you with the results, that we would faithfully pour truth, that we would guide, that we would discipline, that we would give authority to, but Lord, that at the end of the day, we would know that our kids belong to you. And finally, Lord, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you, who's ever placed their faith and their trust in you, God. I pray that the beautiful words in verse five, that you call your children friend, God, that we can know you as your sons and your daughters, God, that you would open the eyes of anyone here today who doesn't know you, and you would draw them to yourself, God, and you would show them the glorious, beautiful splendor of Jesus today. Thank you, Lord this passage and how it shapes and forms us as your disciples. We pray that we would live your mission and your power. In Jesus' name I pray.